Corey, where is the body? What's up guys, welcome to here and here we are to do a breakdown and discussion and review of chapter 416 of My Hero Academia, which is known as Force Your Way Through, Midoriya, and I'll, I'll, I'm leaning with it, I'm rocking with it, I'm like, like once again, my perspective on the series, especially as I review it and I read comments and I analyze it and I reflect on my own thoughts on the series, my thoughts are ever-evolving, ever-changing, ever-inconsistent. But I do have some consistencies that we'll definitely talk about and whether or not I like it or don't like it in this chapter, but this chapter, it's... I don't want to say nothing happens, because something big happens. We do get to a point of no return, essentially. But at the same time, this chapter is a whole lot of wrap-up, a whole lot of cleanup, a whole lot of clarification, which feels weird, because I feel like we keep having these types of chapters every couple chapters or so, where it's like, here's an update on everyone, even though literally nothing's changed. I mean, I guess some people are getting picked up. So there's still our changes. I like the chapter. I like the chapter. We have a lot to talk about. Let's not waste any more time, and let's hop right into it. Editing me. Ready? Three, two, one. What's up, guys? That guy with a pencil here. Fun fact, I do happen to have it on me and keep it on me at all times. And another fun fact, Izuku Midoriya. Golly, bro. God, what? And here we go. I'm about to glaze Kohei Horikoshi. Shock horror. He's literally a monster. Look at this. Every, like, I say this unironically. There are some panels where, especially later on in the chapter, I'll be like, eh, hey, whatever. But nine out of ten times. I don't think there's a single chapter of My Hero Academia, especially in the last 100 chapter run, that can't be considered like a genuine work of art. Like str like straight liquid gold. Like straight up money. M money on pay Like dog. Look at the detail in Midoriya's arm alone. How do you do that? Like I, I know, I know he has assistance. But like, I don't know how you conceptualize this. Put it to page and somehow keep it Balanced enough that it doesn't look over-designed. Or it doesn't look over-detailed. Because that's the thing. you got to be able to balance. And that's why I give Hori so much credit as an artist. There are times where, not even just manga artists, artists in general, they start to lean a little bit into over-design. A little bit into too much detail. A little bit into too much. It's rare, but it happens in even some of my favorite and most top-tier, high-tier artists or manga or anything ever. I love Magi. Sometimes, things are a bit over-designed in Magi. Very rarely. But still, Otaka's sensei is not perfect. Sometimes, in Record of Ragnarok, who, in my opinion, outside of, like, Murata, is the best out of all the series I review and uh, probably a lot of the series I've ever read so far. Once again, I haven't read things like Vagabond or Kingdom. Like, I know there are some other... The heck, I still haven't probably read through Berserk. I'll be completely honest. So, like, there are still series with art that I'm probably going to go and glaze eventually. But... At least of the stuff I've read so far, Wreck and Ragnarok, Rock, fantastic, top tier, next level. Occasionally, some things are over-designed, a little bit too much. Hori somehow manages to put all this extracurricular detail and all these extra fine points and lines from the individual workings of the Black Whip throughout his body to the individual wrappings of his musculature showing the Black Whip underneath his skin, not just over his skin, to the mask, to the hair, to the eye details, to the musculature, everything. He adds so much, so much, which in my, it isn't necessary, but it's still so good. It's still balanced. He uses, he's one of the few that will leave basically no white space on a page. And whatever white space he does leave, it's to emphasize, it's to dramatize, it's to further push the white space that is being used up. Look at how he stands out as this beacon of light tearing into this wall, this flesh, illuminating the darkness that Shigaraki is slumped in. That's storytelling through art. I, I can look at this and tell exactly what's going on here. I don't need, I need no, I could show this to somebody, and they could probably read it. If they, they could not know a Shigaraki from Midoriya, for all we know, but they could probably still tell just by how it's drawn. And notably, the darkness, the negativity, the black, if you will, on some Ichimanji, on my Ichibe type beat, it only emphasizes... The fact that Midori is taking the harder path, the darker path, the road less traveled. And even then, while steeped in darkness, he's still a beacon, an embodiment of light. 
And look at that. There's like one tendril or one spark of traditional one-for-all energy coming off that man. But he's still this bright beacon. Despite being cloaked and soaked in darkness, tearing into this flesh wall of hands. And once again, don't even get me started on Hori with fingers and hands. I swear. He just like me for real for real. The moment I draw hands and actually get them right. <laughs> Your boy's never going to stop. I'll be addicted. I'll be drawing hands for fun. I'll be doing that. So, he's just different. I, I glazed Hori... I will probably proceed to glaze Hori. I glazed Hori yesterday. I'll glaze Hori today. And I'll probably glaze Hori tomorrow. I'm sorry. If there's one thing I gotta do, I gotta give consistent credit to Hori. The one thing you will never... I mean, I can't say never. Because there are times where I've complained because I think sometimes there's weird. Dude, but it's only comparing to Hori. Even Hori on his off days is better than like 90% of the entire field. On his off days. Though some of the art that I'm gonna talk about later <laughs> in terms of like looking a little funny in this very chapter... Still better than 90% of Mangaka out there doing it. What can I say? What can I say? He's just a demon. A monster. A beast. And here's the thing. Unlike comics, and this is why I give so much credit to Hori in particular and Mangaka in general, they cannot use colors. Or they can. You can't have colored manga, obviously. But traditionally, it's a black and white medium. You have to do everything in grayscale. And shockingly enough, I know it seems strange, that's coloring takes more time. But, in my opinion, it takes less creativity to color. Because then you can use color contrast. You can use massive splotches of color in order to illuminate certain things. You can do things with color that you cannot do with black and white. Or you can do things in both fields, but color makes things easier, in my opinion. To use color is like adding dialogue to a silent, silent film. It's still fun. It still works. But I feel like you lose part of the appeal. And the appeal and the ability to utilize the medium so well, to convey it so well without color, when comic artists use color consistently, and really, usually the artists and the colorists are separate, and they typically add different meanings to their respective material. I'm not downplaying comic artists. I just find it extremely impressive what mangaka like Kohei Horikoshi are able to do with black and white. An inspiration. Mm -hmm top tier next level sorry enough glazing <laughs> we shall hop into 416 force your way through izuku midoriya look at bro yelling feeding for it he's off one however i'll get you know i won't talk about it again as the chapters i won't talk about it again just yet shigaraki shut himself away we cut back to airy now notably i'm not sure how many people got to the end of the previous review and notably i checked the comments i don't seem <laughs> i don't seem mad about the intro joke but like i Figured Aerie wasn't really going to be able to do much. Though, as a wise man pointed out to me, then why bother with her being the cliffhanger? Because, like, I mean, she doesn't really do anything. And it's confirmed by this point she's not likely going to do anything unless it's, like, super duper late game. Like, the only thing... Well, I'll get to it in a second. As we see, Aerie starts... <laughs> bucking it! As she's watching the battle go on. And Ectoplasm's like, wait! Where are you going? And Aerie says, Deku-san, he needs my help! And we see that <laughs> Ectoplasm brings up a very valid point. He is hundreds of kilometers away. Like, not meters. Kilometers. Even if he was hundreds of meters away, that would still be too much. But he is hundreds of kilometers away. And we see that Ares just desperate. And I do like this. I do like that Ares is so... Her... And that's the thing. I like many aspects about this chapter. When I complain later, remember, I like many aspects of this chapter. I love how Midoriya has influenced her to not fear her power. To the point where when she sees her hero in danger, her immediate reaction is to go help him with that strength that she thought once cursed her, that he turned into a blessing. She wants to give him that blessing again. She wants to help him. She wants to support him. And once again, Ari's like, what, six? Five? Once again, I forget her actual age. She's tiny. This is a child that is willing to risk... Like, she sees the battle going on. Of course, she probably can't understand the scale of it properly. But, to be fair, maybe she could. Because she was on the back of 100% Midoriya. So, like, she knew. She was tied to that bad boy. She knows how dangerous that battlefield is. To some degree. Some abstract aspect. And still, she was inspired so much by her hero 
that she wants to go out there and risk it. She wants to put her life on the line. She wants to go in so she can go help him. That's fantastic. I love the character work there. That's beautiful. And that's why I kind of excuse last week's hang off or cliffhanger. Why did I say hang off? Last week's cliffhanger. I can excuse it for the fact that I see the vision now. Because once again, we're in the wrap up phase. We're in the wind down phase. The series is ending. Like, <laughs> I, I've been saying that for what feels like a year now. But, like, this series is ending. Slowly but surely. We are running out of time. So this is the time to wrap up character. Explain where everybody is. Let everybody know. Get a full perspective on the entire worldwide battlefield. And then slowly but surely, wrap things up. Calm things down. Get things all nice and orderly. And this is one of the main things you want to do. You want to start with Aerie? Fantastic. Once again, she's a relatively important character. Of course, the impact on the narrative she has relative to the grand scheme, in comparison to what a lot of people were predicting, much, much smaller. Once again, she is, post-overhaul, the thing she's most notable for is reviving Lamillion, who you could arguably remove from the narrative and it would be better. At least in my, like, at least in my opinion. I feel like it is a little, bit, a little bit wacky, goofy, that he got his quirk back so easily, but at the same time, you know, it's my argument, man, right? Like, I'm not... You're not supposed to expect... Like, any lesson that Mirio was supposed to pay was not going to be permanent. It wasn't. I'm not sure what we expected. It wasn't. It wasn't. I, at least in my opinion. Go, once, a bit, once again, that's what helps when the series comes out weekly and I have time to think about it and talk with people about it. Like, we knew. We knew nothing was really going to come of it. So, it makes sense that we're bringing her back for that, but that's about it. Her having any further narrative impact would just harm it, at least in my opinion. And even then, her relative narrative impact that she had by bringing back Lemillion's quirk, relatively inconsequential. Basically inconsequential. Except for... Actually, no, it is still important. It's still important because Mirio calms Midoriya down when he saw Bakugo's body. And Mirio was also a pivotal part of stalling all for Rocky until Midoriya arrived. So it still is very, very important. She's done her narrative role, but... That's her narrative role. Her role and the culmination of her character development is here. It is this point. And considering how important she is to the grand scheme of the narrative, despite not appearing too often or having too much screen time, I still think... Ah! Ah! Pose. Yee. 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 Wait a minute. Wait. What's happening? What's happening? Hold on. My calculations. They're failing. Please. No! Come back to me. Show me the way. Show me the truth. Show me the truth, gosh darn it. I need it. Okay, it's, never mind. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was doing something completely specific and separate. But still, back to this. Wrapping up her character is important because she is important. And I think that's fine. <laughs> I'm glad they're not doing anything because, like, what is she supposed to do? That doesn't harm the narrative. Right? <laughs> like, if she did get all the way to the battlefield and succeed in healing Midori or whatever, narrative harmed. <laughs> if she doesn't, that's fine. And I think wrapping up her character is good here. And we see that Ectoplasm explains. Essentially, this is Hori reassuring us as a reader base. Don't worry, y'all. She can't do Jack. I just, he uses Ectoplasm to say, Dabi, Makia, one for one. Those fights were bigger than we expected. Compromising the evacuation system. It won't be moving anytime soon. But of course, Eri's still desperate. Just like Midori is desperate to do the right thing. But, besides, it appears you haven't stored up enough energy for Rewind. Even if you managed to get there, it wouldn't change anything. Just like that one time with Eraser. I know how you're feeling, but all we can do is believe in him. So, <laughs> I'll, I'll get to what he looks like in a sec. But like, that, I will admit, feels a little bit weird. Because, like, unless I'm mistaken, I, I would need to double check. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Been wrong before about my ergodamia. We'll be wrong again. Her horn was about this size for majority of the overall arc. And then when she started properly leaning into her powers, it actually got bigger. It didn't shrink. So, like, she may not be good enough for a full-scale rewind. But I think she could be able to activate her quirk. Like, it, like her horn isn't, like, it's not, like, this tiny. It's at least this big. It could probably do something. But... Still, I think, I think it's fine that it's not. Once again, I, I like Aerie for what narrative role she serves somewhat. I really, to this day, I really still don't like an infinite 100% one for all. I really don't. But, like, in general, I like the overall arc and her role in it and her role afterwards in the 
festival arc and what that ends up playing for Midoriya's character and gentle and all stuff like that. I think that's good. But at the same time, I was, I, you could hear it throughout all my reviews, even in the short time I wasn't doing my Hero Academia reviews. I feared her narrative potential because it was almighty. But now that we're establishing she can't do anything, hallelujah, don't let her. You can have her heal some people at the end. Just don't let her do anything now. Leave her be. Wrap her up. Put her character on wraps. But that's it. I'm fine with that. Keep it that way. Hori, don't backpedal. I'm begging you. But we see that ultimately, Harry does believe in Midoriya, but she's still worried, which is going to be a theme we're going to see play out further and further in this chapter. In admittedly less subtle ways, but like, I will still appreciate them. As we flash back to blank blank think think and we flash back i forget what when is this i want to say it's the music festival but they're in hero costume i forget when this is but we see that midoriya says that's your dream Ari john then i have to work even harder and we see midoriya who for my guilty gear players out there doesn't he low-key look like jacko with the mask on is it just me like my first my instinct because male went to happy chaos from strive but like just in general like with the like, if you just remove his pupil here, and the way his nose is drawn here, and it's kind of bridged down to, like, a hole, and the way the black whip is kind of forming around his mouth as, like, a mask with fang... Like, it looks it looks straight up like the Jackal mask. And just the general appearance of Happy Chaos, but Happy Chaos when he, like, doesn't have a face, or at least a concrete face. Once again, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe I'm just seeing things. I have been a little bit, a teeny tiny bit obsessed with Guilty Gear after the late. So, like, I wouldn't be shocked if my brain is just manifesting things. Like, gosh, I've, I've come to love way too much about Guilty Gear. From the art style, to the story, to some of the characters. I, I, and I still have Strive. I'm not good at it, though. I need to practice that. But with it being the case, we see Midoriya is still fighting. And I'll get, I'll get to it once we get to the end. Once we get to the end, I'll talk about telling and not showing. Versus showing and not telling. Because Hori can do both. He can do both. But we see Eri starts to cry. And I do like the detail that she goes and grips her horn. Like she's trying to pull out more of it. Dog. Like, that is sad. Like, and I, I can even understand that to a degree. Once again, I am not a magical six-year-old who can rewind time. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. But I do understand that feeling of wanting to be able to help somebody knowing somewhere inside of you you have the potential to do it but just being unable to of course once again i do not live in a world of superpowers luckily enough heaven forbid we did we would destroy each other in like a month but can you imagine if we became like viltrumites we're like hey can you just give us give us the ability to destroy buildings humanity's not lasting but what that mean like, make us captain america make everyone captain america and no one will be special anymore and there will be mass havoc instruction but i can emphasize with empathize with that that feeling where you want to be someone's rock, someone be for there, someone emotionally, or even physically sometimes. Like, some people just need a hug, but they're halfway across the country. You got work in the morning. You can't make it there. Or, something's come up, and you have to be there for something else of higher priority than something like this. Or, just in the case of error, you just can't help. There's nothing you can do. Whether you don't have the ability, the funds, the means, the ability, understanding anything there's sometimes you just gotta leave it up to hope and i can emphasize with that empathize i keep mixing up emphasize and empathize i can't i was wrong but that aside i really do like that and in what i like about this too i like how it's coda who comes and tells her to stop drags her hand away as he says big bro midoriya he he cries so easily Kodakun? I'm also a crybaby. So when I see him doing his best, I feel like I need to step in. Which is accurate. And I do like, the, once again, I like the callbacks of these characters. And let me see, do we, do we tap? Yeah, we, so this is the, unfortunate. I do kind of wish there's a little bit more, like we cut to this random. And I, I, I mean, fine, they're random. They spell it one line though. I'm, I'm still sad that like this guy, but I do like that it's Koda. A person who is literally literally in the exact same position Harry was 
where didn't have the power, didn't have the means, didn't have the availability to help Midoriya when she really, when he really, really wanted to. All he could offer was a meaningless distraction and a bit of hope that he would succeed. I like that it's Coda who is the one to come in, empathize with Aerie, and help her realize there is nothing she can do with harming herself. What she needs to focus on is hoping, believing, wishing for Midoriya's victory. That's the main thing. And it's okay. It's okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel worried. It's okay to accept that you can't do anything. But you shouldn't allow yourself to wallow in that despair. You should keep your eyes on the screen. You should hope. You should focus. And wish for that man to win. Of course. Of course. Once again, my own thoughts on something like that are somewhat similar. Like again, like I said, if you can't do anything, you can't do anything. But I like that it's Coda. Another child who can come in and sympathize with Aerie on that level. Because they both were the same. Nice. Really, really nice. Once again, this chapter is full of nice little character details. And wrap-ups and conclusions that I like. One of which I don't like. But then again, I'm going to have to stare really, really hard at the page to make sure I don't see what I think I should be seeing. But with that being the case we see that this hope or this despair or this hopeful despair is with everybody as they watch Midoriya fight back against the embodiment of evil, the king of darkness, the demon king, if you will. This guy, who never even got a name, I'm pretty sure, is just one of the people who want to keep Midoriya out. And now he's wearing an All Might shirt, watching as All Might's successor battles it out with Shigaraki. Everyone is in this together with me. So, we'll bring it all back. And we immediately cut away. One thing I'll admit... Okay, maybe... Do I tackle this? Or... I'll give it a second. I'll give it a second. The showing not telling. Shigaraki does not feel powerful. It does not feel like he has all for one. It does not feel like he could one-shot Midori anymore. It does... Like, once again, I'm not gonna lie... Shigaraki does not feel like a threat. At least not to Midoriya. To the entire world? Absolutely. But to Midoriya? I don't know. And that's sad to me. I'll admit, it feels like we never really got to see one for all versus all for one. The quirks. I feel like we just haven't gotten that. Shigaraki is resorting to things like the fingers and nothing else. No special quirks. He only used Search for a little bit, and he used Danger Sense somewhat, but those are quirks that we know about. I was really hoping we'd get to see Midoriya have to strategize, improvise on the fly, do crazy things against an actual equal, or even possibly a superior. But I don't know, it low-key looks like Midoriya, who's been sacrificing quirk after quirk after quirk, and is literally so beat, battered, and bruised against this actual immortal deity that he needs to puppeteer his body with Black Whip, it seems he's doing just fine, if not dominating the battle. Shigaraki does not get a single hit in edgewise this entire chapter, and hasn't for the past couple chapters. I don't know, it feels like... And, and this is mainly the Shigaraki fan in me. I'll be completely honest. The bias? Unfathomable. And once again, they've already explained why Shigaraki is likely unable to use all for one to its maximum efficiency and is stuttering and is making mistakes. It's because the other quirk factors from one for all are diving in, disrupting his control, and forcing Shigaraki to essentially reinforce the hatred in his heart. And by doing that, he's not able to properly focus on the battle. He's just relying on instinct to defend himself. That's why all these fingers are coming out. These shackles. These chains that held him before. That is a physical representation of what's actually happening around Shigaraki's heart. The darkness. The hands that gripped and held the child, Tenko Shimura. The hands of one for one. And the hands of his family that he took away. They're out coming to defend that malice, defend that pain, defend that agony, to make sure that Midoriya can't reach him. And thusly, he's reduced purely to defense, while Midoriya's on the offense, forcing his way through. But, I don't know. I'm still, I'm still kind of disappointed with how Shigaraki, I guess, just has been handled, and is going to be handled. It's, it's sad. He just does, he does not fight back. It felt, it really feels like that the character we spent whole years, whole arcs, whole 
multi multiple arcs building up to watching evolve and grow and become his own man and break free and fight back against his oppressors whether they be the oppressors of the hero society or the oppressors of his own mentor we got through all that we got to see all that for him to be reduced to a guy being like, oh, no! against someone who he should be body bagging tearing apart eviscerating Midori still does have Faja. Don't get me wrong. Midori definitely still has a higher mastery of one for all. More experience with his respective Omni Quirk. All that. I get that. But, like, I don't know. It feels like Shigaraki, or at least the Shigaraki I knew and liked and really appreciated. He showed up for a little bit after he got control back, but then he immediately disappeared. I think the Shigaraki that I really liked died at the end of the First War when All for One took over his body. And that's sad. <laughs> I don't know. But once again, it's... And you're going to hear me say this more further and further as we get towards the end of the chapter. It's not bad writing. It is not. I will simply not sit here and lie to you and say it is bad writing. This is established writing. This is something we've been building to for a while. The idea that Shigaraki isn't a person. He's a mask. A facade. Not actually real. We... And it's... See, that's the thing. It sounds bad, but it feels like we wasted time on a character. Because Shigaraki Tomura isn't real. He doesn't matter. He's not fighting back. He's just a wall. He's just the hands that we now need to force our way through in the name of the chapter title. Which is unfortunate. I saw Shigaraki as more than that. I was hoping Shigaraki would somewhat prove Midoriya wrong. Or at least put up a better fight to make Midoriya work for it. And I suppose these fingers are putting up a good fight, but like, man... I don't know. I'm still, I'm still, I'm very mixed on that. And we see, we cut to the remains of the UA. <laughs> the Sky UA. The Ske, if you will. As we see, Kaminori gets picked up and put around Momo's shoulder. And Monoma's here. Actually, no, he was pushed out. I think he was pushed out. I'm, I'll, in the live reaction, we can check it over on Patreon for as little as $1 a month. You can remember, for as little as $3 a month, check out the live reaction to this very chapter. I thought that Monoma had fallen through the portal with Aizawa, present Mike, and Kurugiri. But I think actually, like, Aizawa, like, pushed him out or something like that. I'm pretty sure now. So that's why they have Monoma here still. But, and once again, correct me if I'm wrong, correct me if I'm mistaken. We never wrapped that plot line, did we? Am I, am I, am I, am I lost in the, we never wrapped that plot line. The Aizawa eraser head, well, that's the same person. The Aizawa present Mike. Kudagiri plot. We never wrapped that. Did we? Am I, am I, am I off one? Like, we don't see them this chapter. And I swear we haven't seen them since they've fallen through that portal. Am I tweaking? Like, did, did, did I, did I generally just miss it? Because I know there was a point where I kind of like zoned out of my academia. Did I miss it? Did they already resolve that plot line? Because if not, I don't know what we're doing. But we see that M Momo says, Midoriya-san has gone dark again. And notably, this is Midoriya-san going dark. And, I, and once again, I like it. I like it. I like the multi-layered symbolism of Midoriya's current appearance, right? He He's clawed, cloaked in darkness. He literally has like a fanged mouth here. His eyes are bloodshot. Like, I like all that. Because once again, Midoriya's not taking the easy path out. He's taking the path of darkness while being a hero. He's the dark light, if you will. That could, be a, that could be a metal character name, a character title. The Dark Light. But, like, that's what he is meant to be. So he's gone dark in Momo's eyes because this is what they saw during the Vigilante arc. They saw Midoriya fighting through every last thing. And it's like, oh, that's the thing, though. Whatever, whatever. Because it's just the fact that Midoriya can't do everything on his own. He's not doing everything on his own. He's relying on the others to take care of the other villains and threats and problems. So technically, the Vigilante arc isn't being compromised here at all because they already did everything they could do. And it was always going to be Midoriya's, Midoriya's job to fight Shigaraki. That's the truth. But I do like that. The idea that Midoriya is still coming across as dark, as horrific, as malefic, as monstrous, physically, and he's embodying that, but that's not just a reference to you would never believe he was a hero based on his appearance, because it doesn't look like a traditional hero, but at the same time, it plays into the fact that he's taking the harder path. He's... <laughs> not to knock Shigaraki to oblivion, no matter how many people, myself included, Shavili may just have to do that, or should do that, 
But he's taking the darker path, reaching into the heart of Shigaraki, desperately trying to pull him out of that state, that malice, that darkness. Freeing Tenko Shimura, destroying the mask of Tomura Shigaraki is the hardest thing one could do. And that's what he's doing. The darkest path, the one most muddied and the one most unclear is the one Midori is taking. And his physicality, his appearance is reflecting that. And notably, we get this interesting little point from Kaminari. I'll even just read the whole conversation out because I can talk about so I can talk about it in full. Kaminari frowns, looking at it. And he says, Yo Momo, you know that one trope in comics where characters like me and Kirishima keep saying I trust that guy? No matter what and stuff. Uh, I'm not actually too familiar with those works. Huh. <laughs> I guess you don't read Shonen. Well, uh, Midoriya's probably the strongest in the whole world right now. So why is it that I still don't have that feeling? As when All Might would say, it's fine now. Yeah, Momo. Does being worried mean I, I don't trust him? And then we cut away. I'll admit, this, once again, it feels like the, I'm, maybe I'm missing pages in the chapter. It feels like Momo was supposed to say something back to him. But, like, she never died. Like, we just cut away. Like, this is this is the two-page interaction we get here. And then we just cut to something completely different that may just rustle my jimmies a little bit. But I there are multiple parts to this. There are multiple parts to this. Number one, Kaminari. It is simultaneous. Well, I'll first acknowledge the fourth wall break. Characters like me and Kirishima, shown in manga. I see what you're doing, Hori. I'm not blind. That's like <laughs> that's like me being like, ah, you see. In this, well, okay, I can't really do a comparison because once again, I'm real. I think. <laughs> I, I'm, am I? Am I not real? <laughs> Does anyone got news for me? Am, am, am I a program? Cause, cause, am I inorganic? But that aside, I can't necessarily make a comparison. I do like that little fourth wall break, but. In this case, I understand why Kaminari feels concerned and conflated about his feelings here, because anyone would, right? Like, especially in a moment like this, where you're so worried, where you're so scared, where even if you know for a fact that Midoriya is the strongest person in the world, even if you know the fact that he has the full capability, and even if you can see that he's quite literally beating the brakes off of Shigaraki. Once again, Shigaraki does not land a single hit this entire chapter. He's barely even fighting back. Midoriya, he has everything, but he's still a child. He's still Kaminari's age mate. All Might was a full-grown man. Been a full-grown man. A full-grown titan of a man, too. That man was like 10 feet tall. Of course, the deep words of Christopher Sabbath saying, I am here! Don't worry, students. I'll stop the villain. Is going to sound a whole lot better than I forget who voices Midoriya. They were going to work for TFS and be teen... Real teen Gohan, adult Gohan, or Busaga Gohan, but they ended up getting cast as Midoriya all those years ago. I forget their name, but Christopher Sabat doing the All My Voice will always sound more reassuring than Midoriya saying, Don't worry, I got it! I, I, I haven't listened to Dub Midoriya in a while, but still, I can understand that aspect of it where it's like, Yeah, sure, you know everything. You're prepared, you understand that this is the end all be all. But just because it's someone that you know, it's less disconnected. There's less history there with Midoriya saving everybody, saving massive groups of people, saving the world. So I do like that Kaminari is somewhat going against his character role, where he doesn't necessarily have faith, where he's still worried. And I think that's fine. And I actually do like that dimension being added to the narrative. Once again, I do appreciate that. I do find it funny that Momo just apparently has never interacted with any piece of fiction ever. Like... It's not just shown in manga where that, like, it happens all the time where characters rally around one character. Like, this happens in history, Momo. Like, did you not pay attention in class? But, that aside, it is, it is a nice detail. It is a nice detail. I like that it is being brought up here and we're wrapping this up. Speaking of wrap-ups, we do see that the helicopter goes, wah, 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 and Asui, who, let me, now let me, let me get in close. Let me, let me take a look in a book reading Rainbow on this one. Give me a moment. I'll have a look deep. Where is Raraka? Where is the body? Hmm. I don't see. Okay. This could be Toga. This right here could be Toga. 
Hmm. She didn't dissolve. I don't think she didn't dissolve. He wasn't like a clone. I may be misremembering. But we see the chopper lands in. The chopper goes wapa wapa wapa. It lands. Asui crying and bawling her eyes out. Knees down. And I believe this is one of the, um, not, a, not an ambulance worker. Hey, ah! One of the medical team is like, that's right. She's on the verge of being cooked. It's that girl from Iwe. Her name is Gravity or something. I'm not sure. She'll be arriving there soon. So, they just have Uraraka's body. Unless this is meant to be Toga right here. This other person right here. Unless that's meant to be Toga. Which implies Toga may still be alive. I'm, I don't like the implications of it, but I may be reading too deep. That's what I'm going to say. I'm going to assume she's just left there because she's already cooked and she's also a notorious villain. And that's what I'm going to assume happened with Toga and that this isn't Toga or Toga scurried away because we don't see the body. It's very unclear. Once again, this whole interaction where Toga may or may not have gone missing is like four panels. One of them being an entire Asui panel, the other panel being a whole woman that we don't even know the name of, and then these two. I'm just shocked because we don't even see Toga. Which is strange. I hope she didn't live. And it mainly comes from the fact that I felt like her going out on her own terms was the best kind of ending that character could have had. And her living undermines that. But at the same time, I'll admit, her surviving and moving on to a new life is the point of my academia, quote unquote. Like, the villains aren't supposed to just fall. They're supposed to be rehabilitated and saved and stuff like that. So, technically, her being alive would actually fit better into the overall narrative schema. I just wouldn't like it because I prefer what I thought was her actual end. Very 50-50, if you know what I'm talking. Let's see. We cut over to the former All for One battlefield, and we see that a reporter is running up as, The UA robots are heading your way. The gravity girl needs help. Oh, look! The feed from Midoriya's fight is coming in. What the heck is happening? Leave that for later! We see Hawks is... Oh, sweet mother of mercy, I can't feel my bones. Oh, uh, Tokiyami, pick up my bones! My bones! Tokiyami, my bones! Oh, wait a minute. Gravity. It's... It's that girl. And he flashes back. Notably, <laughs> Tokoyami just... <laughs> being brutalized here is crazy. He doesn't even get a word in this chapter. He's just... Not word nor thought. That man's gone. <laughs> Which is hilarious. It's it's hilarious in a bad way, right? Because obviously Tokiyami's in agony. But still, dog, what? And we see... And then Hawks remembers, because he was at the UA incident, where they tried to block Midori out, where she, where we had a flashback to Araka's speech. If all of us are even a little capable of seeing each other united as one, then... Then we cut away. Once again, we're very, we're very quick. We're moving very quickly. We're covering a lot of ground. But once again, that's the thing. I'll admit, this chapter does feel a little bit redundant and a little bit irrelevant for most of it. Because we knew where everybody was already. We presumed they were already going to get help. But I, like I've been saying throughout this entire review, I like the character moments. So, like, I'm not sure if this is a take it or leave it kind of chapter. Where, like, this is a chapter that I like because it wraps up Ari and Coda very, very well. And I guess, once again, it sort of wraps something we're about to get to. But at the same time, we've already sort of had a rap for that character and the character that they're with. So I'm, I don't know, I'm still very, very, very mixed on this chapter as a whole. At least right now. Once again, I'll, I'll get to my point rating and thoughts in a little bit. But we see Midoriya is charging through. Once again, the fingers are fighting back. They keep regenerating, but he's not even getting tagged. It's just da he's just dashing through them. No issue reaching to the core of Shigaraki. And we see that Rocklock came up to the roof. And he's like, uh, hey. Why are you up in Midoriya? And we see Nagant say, and I, and I do love this, I love this here, former hero and former villain, Lady Nagant. He, he opened up my heart. And Rahul was like, hey, yo. And Nagant says, pause. I'm not like that for real, for real. He does the thing that evildoers hate the most. Yeah. 
When fighting villains, we gotta make them lose the will to fight as fast as we can. And he's probably doing the same thing right now. It's weird that... It's weird that Rock... I'm not sure if this is supposed to be continuation of Rock Lock, or it's supposed to be Nagant, but regardless, why do either of them make a question mark noise? Like, they both know what they're doing. Or know what Midori's doing. As Rock Lock says, he's chosen a thorny path, refusing to see the world as black and white. And Nagant says, he suffers a lot in the process, but that's what makes me want to root for him all the more. And we see Midoriya fighting for his life. I do I do like, I do kind of wish, though, we had kept up the motif. I, I know y'all are going to be like, ah, oh, Pencil, of course you're going to have an artistic complaint. And in fact, I kind of glaze over whatever artistic complaint. Common art looks a little bit weird here. Once again, he's still covered in extra detail. That was the only, like, weird artistic thing in the entire chapter. And this. But, like, once again, he still clears. He looks like Saitama here. Just remove the hair. But with that being the case, I do kind of wish we had kept the full, like, you wouldn't believe he was a hero look and motif going. I, I kind of do wish that we kept that. Because this, this more clean look, it kind of, it's nice, and he's crying, and I do like that. I like the detail that we can see his tears. But I I was definitely kind of hoping for the continuation of that, like, whole vibe. Where he's a dark hero, he's a light within the darkness, using the darkness to try and reach someone trapped in that malice, in that darkness. But we kind of throw that all away. Even the black whip lines sort of fade massively. It's mostly just pure Midoriya. Which makes sense, right? We're talking about the purity of Midoriya and how he's willing to do the right thing in a way that only he can. But at the same time, man, gosh darn it, I really wanted to see like a high detail, high graphic full-scale spread version of this look. I really like it. Once again, it reminds me of Guilty Gear. But, with it being the case, we see... Rocky, you're a full-grown man! Fight back! Whoa, what is... What is... Oh, shoot. Golly gee, Willikers, tell us. What is happening? What is transpired? No! Please! What, what, what is... What is going on? I actually don't even know what's... How did you get all the way over there? What is happening? Why must you be this way? Move. Golly. Please. Cease. Cease your tomfoolery. Golly. Come on now. Let's get back over here. Alright. Boom. Golly. But. Shigaraki, you're a full grown man, bro. Stay away! Fight back! <laughs> Shigaraki. Fight back, please. You're supposed to be my goal. You're supposed to be the best. Like, the reason you'll never hear me complain about Endeavor is because he's never had a fall off. He's just, oh, he's been peak, all right? He started off horrible and he had a whole consistent journey of development. This reminds me of Baby Rocky. USJ Rocky. Stay away! Oh, don't hurt me. You are the strongest creature on the planet, supposedly. Supposedly, Midoriya doesn't stand a chance against you. But you're a quirk singularity. You have all for... You're a monster, Shigaraki. I'm not intimidated by this. I'm not scared. I see a baby. And I get that's the point. That's the thing. It's the, it's the issue. It's the disconnect. I cannot say this is bad writing. Because this is the point. It's been the point ever since the first war. It's been the point for over a hundred chapters now. So I should just get over it. But man, this is this isn't my goal. That's not my Rocky. That's just it's not him. It's not my Rocky. My Rocky, he was goaded. He would fight back. He would smile in the face of adversity. Midori would have to struggle to breach through him. And I guess he was struggling to breach through the fingers, but I'm talking about everything. But no. Stay away. Oh, don't hurt me. Just like his father. No pride. Nothing. Empty and worthless. Just like his father. Crying out. So he kept away from him instead of fighting back. Rocky. You disappoint me. Like, once again, this is why he can't be my favorite new gen antagonist. If we were, if we were to, if this series had ended at first war, Shigaraki would easily be my favorite character. Well, it ended at first war pre All for One takeover. Easily would be my favorite character. Shigaraki can't come back from this, bro. He can't. The mask, the facade that we spent so much time building, he's it's gone, shattered, reduced to atoms by the fist of Izuku Midoriya. And while that's beautiful for Midoriya's narrative, 
man, does it just shatter shatter any respect or anything that I had for Big Rocky, which is so unfortunate. But we see as he breaks through, punches through, he reaches that forsaken house. What is it that appears before Deku? The destruction of everything stemming from that house. There's my Rocky. Look at him. Look at him right here. There's my Rocky. This man, this Rocky, he's just he's just not my Rocky, bro. But once again, it's not bad writing. Now, we, now that we've gotten to the end, I can talk about it fully. None of this is bad writing. Not a single bit of it. Not a single bit. Like I said, I like every single character moment in this chapter. I love the opening page and the visual storytelling it does of the dark light Midoriya saving Shigaraki from the depths of the fingers, the depths of those chains that have bound him. I love Aerie's character moment here and ectoplasm reasoning with her and trying to calm her down but being unable to reach through and breeze through but Koda wrapping up his character being able to come in and calm Aerie down and show her the way, show her the light. That's fantastic. That's beautiful. Even this guy. Once again, I don't care. I really don't. But at the same time, wrapping up his whole arc about the whole idea of welcoming and trusting Midoriya and putting their faith in him and working together in a way while all he can do is hope for Midoriya while Midoriya does the actual fighting. I like that. I like the lack of hope, the lack of faith in Midoriya due to the fear that would naturally be caused, born of this scenario, all that. I think that's fantastic. I like... I don't like the fact that Toga may still be alive, but I'm glad we're wrapping this up one way or another. Same thing with Hawks. And I like that he's somewhat reflecting on this as he smiles and falls apart and i you know i love lady nagat and i like that her thing is getting wrapped up for like the third time now and rock lock is another conclusion again and then midoriya does breach through i like all that but it's just it comes at the expense of things that i did like too it comes at the expense of shigaraki actually being a threat it comes with the expense of Midoriya actually feeling fatigued. It comes at the expense of what feels like years upon years of build-up to the greatest new gen villain ever, being thrown away, and the mask that I suppose Shigaraki was truly being revealed to be just that. A mask. A waste. Something to be shattered and thrown away for a child. Still interested to see how he ends it, though. Once again, not right, bad writing. It's just my own preferences. So I gotta give the chapter a 10 out of 10. I don't, I don't know, I'm probably so shocked, just after all the, but it's still 10 out of 10. If I'm looking at it objectively, if I'm putting aside my biases, there's nothing wrong with this chapter. The art is fantastic. We are wrapping up numerous characters from Yaoyorozu to Kaminari to Eri to Koda to Rocklock to Nagant to characters that don't even have names. Ravity, Asui, Hawks, Togoyat, like we're just wrapping up so much. And it's all done very efficiently in the span of what? Not even, like, this isn't even a full length chapter, I don't believe. I think it's like 14 pages. How long is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Fifteen page chapter. Not even full 20 pages. And he's making peak. I just don't like it. <laughs> So I gotta give it a 10 out of 10. There's no issues with the chapter. However, that's what I think. Please know what you guys think in the comment section down below. Do you think Shigaraki has lost it all? Because if that's the case, please, if you made it all the way to the end of this video, leave Lost Rocky. Like, literally just lost, the word lost, and then Rocky, as in, like, the end of Shigaraki. In the comment section down below. I want to thank you so much for watching. Please remember to leave a like, share, comment, and subscribe. And make sure you hit that little notification bell so you don't miss out on any videos that come to the channel. Also, also, I do happen to have a Patreon below where you can support me for as low as one, kind of one, month. Things like exclusive videos, early content, and more. You also want to become a member of the channel for as low as $3 a month to get the same perks and more. So those perks will include the 20-minute live reaction to this very chapter. Along with ad-free variations of all my videos, and... You can become a $25 patron or a $25 member to order whatever video you want. Now, I'd like to thank you so much for watching once again, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day. This is Daggle the Pencil, writing off. I'd like to give a thank you to our three dollar members: Connor Plays, Greyhound, Akids Void, Astro, Red Wolf Four Seven Six Five, Eternal Flame, and Teen Mitgau. And I'd like to give a thank you to our $5 patrons, Steron, Sean, Panda Goat, Midnight Lord 21, Metal Solid Crisis, Kevin, Igneo, and Ehack1. And I'd like to give a thank you to our $7 member, Autumn Mornings Lazo. And I'd like to give a big thank you to our $10 member, Jay Warrior. 
And I'd like to give another thank you to our $10 patrons, Joaquin and Idemokami. And I'd like to give a gargantuan thank you to our $25 member, Alex Ice Rose. And I'd like to give another gargantuan thank you to our $25 patron, Winter. Well, along with another juicy thank you to our $25 patron, China Doll 9 And I'd like to give a final giga gargantuan thank you to our $25 patron, Calvin Elder.